Okay, and I'm introducing Hannah Panatello. She's an artist raised and currently working here in New Orleans. She received her BA from Brandeis in 2009 and her MFA from Cranbrook, Cranbrook Academy of Art in 2016. She has um, exhibited widely around New Orleans and around the country. Her work is held in collections in the city of New Orleans and the Cotton Museum. Her work is included in creative atlases by writer and activist Rebecca Solnit on Fan the Whole City. A New Orleans Atlas co-authored Rebecca Snedeker, and Nonstop Metropolis and New York City Atlas, co-authored with Joshua Jelly Shapiro. In 2018, she was an artist in residence at the Joe Mitchell Center for Five Months um, here in New Orleans, and she recently received a platforms grant um, that Antenna and Ashe and the Pelican Bomb and the Warhol Foundation all get together and donate money for this. So she won that award. Um, since 2018, she has sought to divest her studio practice with fossil fuels as much as possible. She does this through the material she uses, choosing recycled, free and sustainable materials. By, by powering her art, works, and studio practice with renewable resources through her solar car and by traveling by bike to the country. I introduce. Hello, everyone. 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 Um, I also 
think a lot about just like the wild Louisiana nature, um, specifically cat's paw and its ability to grow over things and create sort of these surreal shapes. It's obviously a part of your own neglect, but um, sort of inspired by the forms and thinking about the root system, the tubers, that um, are so hard to eradicate. Um, and also think about the nose and our body, some of my sculptural work, kind of notice those references next. Um, so, yeah, I go a little further. These are the drawings that I, started, um, that I started making, coming back, and really inspired by just liking to my studio and seeing lots that maybe hadn't been mowed for a few months or a few years and seeing like the new landscapes that would emerge and also the sort of illegal dump sites that spring up and become these new ecosystems. Um, and these are handmade paper and they're pretty large for the next one. Um, so kind of like imagining these landscapes that are going to come after us like has inspired by all these sites throughout the city that are already Becoming that um, with a little bit of neglect. Um, I'm starting to scale up my work so that this is like 10 feet long and it's a, it's a drawing of a landscape, but your body has a relationship with it. You're like walking across the work to experience it. Next slide. Um, last year I participated in Fossil Free Fest, which is a really awesome festival. I'm going to talk about it more. Um, but specifically, I went on this toxic tour, which was led by Hidden history tours and Louisiana Market Brigade, and really drawing a connection between the plantation era and the petrochemical age, which, like, like, growing up in Louisiana, I thought I had an understanding of, but really didn't understand that direct connection and just the legacy of exploitation and extraction that is continuing today. Um, these are some of the fence line communities where, just like, people's homes, industry has just sprung up around it and they're just being poisoned. Next slide. Um, I also look a lot at petrochemical America, it's a little bit cropped, but um, collaboration between the photographer Richard Mizroff and Kate Orr, landscape architect and sociologist, um, it's a really awesome resource. But um, this is the past of the river, before it was levied, it was sort of going all over the place. Um, in the plantation era, they started to build levees, and you can see all those parts of the land are industry and inside. Um, also in their book, you can't really see it, but they sort of map all the different chemicals that are being produced in Spencer Alley, and New Orleans is like all the way over there, but obviously we're not being so heavily poisoned as the folks living on the fence line, but we're downriver and downwind, so these are our issues as well. Next slide. Um, and also hard to see, they also map all the different products that are produced. Um, in Cancer Alley, um, which is what this sort of strip from Baton Rouge to New Orleans is called because of the high rates of cancer people are experiencing living there. Um, but it's a lot of sort of disposable plastic products um, that Cancer Alley is kind of known as this national sacrifice zone because all these things that make our lives so convenient um, are sort of produced on the backs of people living here that are directly suffering. Um, Slide. Um, I was really inspired in the book by just like the photographs of Richard, Richard Wizroff that are really poetic. Um, this one is called the Norco Cumulus Cloud, which looks just like a regular cloud formation, but it's actually specific to the hydrocarbons they're putting up that are interacting with the clouds and the specific sort of cloud exists over there and that shows up in my drawings as well. Next slide. Um, I also look at Michelle Barisco's work. She my teacher at NOCA, and it's a really inspiring artist, environmentalist, um, and it's done a lot of photography of the Supreme coastline, and also looking at Google Earth, just seeing what that looks like. Next slide. Um, a fellow artist told me about Pasigomerance, which is actually this new kind of rock that humans are making, and it's going to be kind of like our legacy once we're gone, the plastic that we're making now, nobody really knows how long it will take to decompose, but um, this will be our sort of legacy and a lot about future fossils and like specifically in Louisiana, like our connections with creating plastic and 
what that will be. So, I was already kind of making sculptures that look like this. It was a happy accident, but um, we'll see this in my work. Um, so I started making my drawings that had more overt references to the petrochemical industry and thinking about um, all of that infrastructure and that it will, it's going to still be here even if we're gone. Um, and sort of looking against the landscape just to imagine how ecosystems will grow over that. And this one's called Solstalgia, which is a new kind of like coin term of this nostalgia for a place that still exists, but you kind of know will be lost. Uh, global warming. Next slide. Um, as part of Fossil Free Fest, I got a grant to do this installation called Terraforming in the Anthropocene. And I was using pipes and then cement and plastic waste to create these planters, plants of Louisiana, native and locally adapted vines that sort of grew over the canopy over the course of the summer. Um, and it had its own solar panels, next slide, and rainwater harvesting. So the piece was harvesting solar power, which is powering a pump to pump the rainwater to feed it. And then at night, lights would come on. Um, you can see sort of the detail of the, the orb-like vector-shaped plastic um, and the vines growing on the top, next. And then at night, lights would come on from the piece and so we pick this uh, otherworldly vibe to it, and I really like the idea that people, this was in the city park all summer, so people who weren't necessarily going to see art might happen upon it and sort of like be drawn in by the lights and the plants and then notice sort of the rough, rusty infrastructure and like bits of plastic or like a plastic bag and like these things were sort of all implicated in thinking about their connection to it and then having the solar panels as like a a possible solution and like I, little things we can all be doing. But obviously, there's much bigger things we need to take on and like have, having a space for conversations think about like what is needed from our government on a global scale. Next slide. Um, with the platforms grants, I was able to host workshops and like talk to young people about these issues and thinking about renewable resources both through the solar panels, the solar power, and the rainwater, but also we did paper making and thinking about um, making paper from plants as a renewable resource and also using plastic to make paper as a different way of thinking about materials in our everyday lives and what kind of renewable resource we need. Um, I think it click on the middle image, it's a video. See if you can see Next slide. <laughs> So 
really bringing together this legacy of the plantation, time of chattel slavery, and tricking this like one of the worst people out. Worst crops for the enslaved people that have harvested it, and then plastic, which is the descendants of that in the landscape. and 30 feet wide, and again, thinking about this sort of like combined present future landscapes, and also like the disappearing coastline, and also creating a cycle. And um, there is the north of the North Cloud. The very top is um, an oak tree from City Park, actually, like the John McDonough tree. I had been drawing it for a long time and realized that that was what it was called. It was like a huge honor of enslaved people and then became this philanthropist, but white supremacist sort of like this whole system upholding that. Um, and thinking about refining patterns, refining sugarcane, refining of petrochemicals and patterns as like also weather patterns and these cycles, but ultimately things that can be changed for like these habits we get into, but things that can be changed. Um, but um, this piece is called a Tropical Pictures, um, and sort of an indoor version of the terraforming piece. Again, we're thinking about these future gardens that might emerge from our cultural detritus if we don't change the way we're living. Um, and the solar cart from the outdoor piece now powers my studio. So, like, all this work. With the lights, the solar power is like another layer to the work uh, slide. And this is another configuration of that same installation that was at the CAC um, just a month or two ago. Um, so you can see how it's a little bit shifted. Um, next slide. Like this. this was a recent.
But I'm also really inspired by activism that's happening around these issues right now. Um, I participated in the March Against Death Alley, which there's sort of been a rebranding of, death, of Cancer Alley as Death Alley now. It's basically, if you're living there, it is, as it is a death sentence. People like, are dying. Um, and they have the ability to move, but it's sort of financially impossible for a lot of these people. Um, and I participated in the march and found it really inspiring. It's sort of led by these communities of color, Rise St. James, Rise St. James, and Concerned Citizens of St. John. Rise St. James is like all women, which is awesome, and sort of resisting this paradigm of just that this is how it's always been, and this is how it's always will be. And they're like, no, we're fighting for our lives, and we can change these things. Um, and I believe that art is important, but I also think like this kind of activism is important, and I'm really inspired by it. Um, but and that's my talk. So I don't have any questions. So what is this stuff made of? That is a um, plastic cane, which is this paper that I make. It's like shredded um, plastic and sugar cane. And then I draw on it. But it becomes like more physical. It's hard to see in this picture, but like as we get closer, the image kind of disintegrates and you can pick out the bits of like stagger foam and like on the wrappers. Oh, where does it come from? Um, refineries. Um, yeah. I was actually doing some water monitoring. When the Biobridge pipeline was being built, you could like sort of monitor the construction as a way to sort of fight it. And along that route was a refinery, and I just like asked them. They just produce mountains of bagasse, and some of them use it as fuel to like power it, but they just like Groda actually chucks in a truck at the cost of gas, and they use it as fertilizer. It's just like, they don't know what to do with it. So it's easy to get. But it's like at least an hour away. All the refineries are like an hour or so away. But they're all like right amidst a kind of chemical. So by refinery, you mean sugar cane refinery? Yeah, the sugar cane yeah. refinery. But they're, I mean, yeah, they're all like mashed together. Yeah.